Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Littlefield here in Brooklyn, New York. Tonight I'm going to interview and profile a dynamic keyboardist and band leader who's making a lot of waves here in New York City. In fact, keyboardist Jesse Fisher and his group Soul Cycle have a dynamic record on the Oblique Sound label called Retro Future. And what he's doing on this record is he's paying homage to those great, great funky fusion soul records of the 1970s by artists as diverse as Herbie Hancock, Les McCann, as well as Lionel Niston Smith. But he's also putting a contemporary twist on his own music, featuring music as diverse as classical, hip-hop, funk, and electronic music. We sat down earlier and we talked about the concept of this new album. We talked about the direction of him fusing both jazz and funk and electronic to jazz music, as well as talk about what makes this project so different than all the other music that has come out in the past as far as the 70s fusion as well as the 80s new wave so sit back relax and enjoy the sounds of mr jesse fisher and soul cycle live here at littlefield here in brooklyn new york Jesse, this is a really funky album. In fact, when I set the piece up, I, I was telling viewers that this record really kind of goes back to the origins of those funky electronic funk soul records of the 70s, but there's also a little tangent of new wave of the 80s. Yeah, it's definitely... Um I think my previous albums had been more 70s oriented, 60s and 70s, and um, this one I was really trying to think about, you know, because I was born in 1980, so the music I was coming up with was a little different, and trying to, you know, see how that fit in with what, you know, what I had been doing on my previous records, which was very like 1973, Herbie Hancock, Headhunters, Weather Report, that kind of stuff. So mixing in with that, the stuff from the 80s and the synthesizers and drum machines and sequencers and um, how all that stuff has kind of come back into the pop music landscape now, you know, in 2012. So it was an experiment. I mean, definitely a lot was on my mind. A lot of world music, jazz, funk. And I don't, this is what I always say, I don't think of those things as different genres. They're more um, just different attitudes. And you can always hold multiple attitudes in your head at any given time. So, you know, the jazz attitude is there, the attitude of creative improvisation, playing with a group and the, the actual commun the community, like the communal activity of, of music. But there's also this aspect of like very strict structure, you know, metrical rhythmic structure that came in with drum machines and computers that were programmed. So I think it was a little bit of a mix of that. 
explain to the viewers out there what soul cycle is because it's an amalgamation of a lot of things that you just talked about yeah. but there's also a sonic sound to this group that brings to light what you're trying to put out musically yeah man i mean it's it's what i talked about it's definitely um how would i put this it's definitely about the activity of making music. You know, it's not just about the notes and the rhythms, but it's about the fact that we work together and we live together and we travel together and it's a group of people that are close as friends, you know, and I think that's where it has to start from. Um, and I think that was a lot more prevalent in the groups of the 60s and the 70s. Um, so that's where it starts from, but it's also people who are very um, open, open-minded about music and about life in general. And it's people who are interested in listening as well as speaking. And, you know, that's the problem with musicians and performance artists of all types, is that we all want to express ourselves. It's harder to find people that want to also listen and accompany. So I feel blessed that everyone in the band is, is a great accompanist, in addition to a great soloist. And I think that's what makes us have this sort of communal sound. Um, and, you know, like we said before, it's, it's mixing in all the music that we're interested in. We don't just gig in any one genre. All of us are on the road um, or recording with musicians of various different types. Um, and I think that's what, that's what I like in my own life. I like a lot of variety. Just as a music fan, I like to listen to music of all types. And I think that comes through in my music. What's interesting about this project, and also you've collaborated with and accompanied a lot of great musicians, but what you've done in this project is you've made this album very right now, because electronic music is coming back. It never really left, but I'm, I'm thinking of like Flying Lotus, I'm thinking of like the, the, the innovators of what like Tricky and Massive Attack did in the 1990s, yeah. Portishead, you're bringing a little bit of that back also. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the album is retro future. There's a lot of different periods that I'm, I'm thinking about when I think of retro. Like, I'm definitely thinking about 1967, Booker T and the MGs. I'm thinking about 1973, like Sly and the Family Stone. I'm thinking about 1996, like you said, Portishead, Tricky, like DJ Shadow, a lot of that kind of stuff, that real trippy like trip hop i was 16 and what's interesting is that because i didn't live through the 70s i was discovering the 70s music at the same time that i was discovering the 90s music so for me like that was an explosion like between 91 say and 98 all this cool music was happening in that moment but i was also going to the record store and trying to buy up as many like freddie hubbard records as i could and otis redding and aretha franklin and 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 just checking out all this music so yeah, I mean, in a way, it's like when I'm when it, when we make music, we have to go back to 
a place in our childhood or in our past that really moves us. So for this record, that's what I was thinking of. And um, I love the textures that are created with electronic music, but I also love that activity of making music acoustically, you know, with, with people in the room with you. So I think there's a mix of that on this album. as we said earlier you know there's always a 360 to this but you're relatively young and you've got a lot going on right now you you also run your studio which is electric indigo studio your company Alora Isabor you are a band leader composer let's talk about how all this began yeah I mean it all like you said I wear so many hats and nothing really came before anything else like from a from a very early age I was always interested in both playing you know but also the technical aspects of music and in fact I probably was more interested in that than performing I never saw myself as a performer I was always you know behind the boards you know high school I was on the tech crew I was doing everything except perf performing I was you know um, running sound doing lighting design doing stage managing, um, you know, doing a lot of computer stuff. I was a computer programmer from the time I was a kid. So um, at the same time, I was playing, and I was in the high school jazz band. I played clarinet, um, bass, banjo, mandolin, drums, guitar, keyboards. So I had so much going on. And, you know, as I get a little bit more... As the years go by, let's put it that way, as the years go by, I try to figure out, okay, I need to kind of focus on certain things so instrumentally I'm focusing more on piano and keyboards um, but as you say I'm also doing a lot of engineering and producing which is something that I love doing and it's another aspect of the way I think about music but yeah I mean since the time I was 10 you know I had my little four track I was actually re trying to recreate um, you know I take a Beatles song for instance like a George Martin produced like I would try to recreate it track for track because I knew they were dealing with four tracks back in the day. So I was always interested in that aspect of how, how do they make that sound? What do they do? Did they reverse the tape or did they have a compressor on it or did they have some type of distortion or what kind of instrument was that, you know? So there's, there's that and um, I'm just blessed to have, you know, a studio that I can work out of, that I can work on my music, but also to have all these great new artists come in and that I can work with them to, to create a sound that's right for them. So it's kind of like many different sides of the, of the business. And I also do, you know, video editing and graphic design and motion graphics and all this other stuff. So I, th there's never a dull moment. I, you know, I'm always learning. I'm always staying busy. Brooklyn is just really, in the last decade, has been on the up and up. We got a basketball team now. Yeah. And the music scene has just been intense. And I think that 
Tone Records and the Dab mm-hmm. King started that yeah. and Truth and Soul. And then yeah. now you have your studio. What is it about Brooklyn right now that is really the hotbed of the music scene right now? And what is it doing to a lot of musicians like yourself that's getting people from all over the world wanting to move back to Brooklyn? Yeah, I mean, well, you, I think you answered the question because I think the fact that there are people here from all over the world is what makes it an attractive place to live. You know, for someone like me, because I am interested in learning about so many different cultures, different musics, different types of food, different types of dance, art, and it's like you're surrounded by all this um, creativity. And even just like, just like walking down the street, you're going to see so many different people and they're all, you know, not everybody's an artist. Some people own businesses, some people do whatever, but you're just going to get so many different energies, and I think that's really important. There's different races, different ages, different genders, different orientations, and it's it's just a place where there's so many different neighborhoods, but they're all very close together and connected. Um, I've never really lived anywhere else, so I can't speak on other cities, but I know that that's what I get out of living here in Brooklyn, and it's it is very important to what we do as artists that we're surrounded by things that we're not familiar with. You know what I mean? like things that are new and things that make us think about things in a different way. So I, I get a lot out of just walking down the street, honestly. influences on the keyboards as well as the piano? I mean, well, first of all, it's not even limited to the instrument, but definitely, you know, Joe Zavano and Herbie Hancock are guys that I've studied a lot and respect a lot as composers and producers in addition to their playing. But someone like George Duke. Um, but, you know, it, it, it goes beyond that. I mean, I listen to a lot of Straight Ahead, so Bill Evans, um, Ahmad Jamal, Keith Jarrett, a lot of you know, there's a lot of really amazing pianists that are out there now. Aaron Parks, um, Taylor Eaksty, you know, um, Chris Bowers. There's so many great... I can just, you know, last night, Christian Sands, like I was telling you, so much amazing talent. So there's that. And I work very hard on getting my piano to a point where I'm happy with it. Um, but then, you know, it goes beyond that because there's so much music that makes you feel something. And it's not just what you play. You know, there's music that's just electronic. There's folk music, you know, there's classical music. I listen to a lot of really everything. I mean, I was listening to, I was at the Turkish restaurant the other day, and they're playing some crazy music that I'd never heard of, and I shazammed it, and I got it, and it's like, 
you know, traditional, I guess it's traditional Turkish music. And there's so much music. And then um, I was on YouTube and I found some traditional Armenian music that I was in love with. So there's so much music that I can't even like limit it myself, you know. There's rock music, there's the Beatles, there's pop music, Stevie Wonder, um, hip hop music. Like there's just so much that I listen to even on a given day. So it's kind of amazing that we have so much technology that allows us to like check all this out. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to know what the next generation, the musicians who are raised with Spotify and with YouTube, what they're going to come up with next. Because when I was growing up, it was a little bit more limited. I had to go to the, you know, to garage sales or go to the art sale or go to the record store and whatever they had was what I was listening to or go to the library. You know, remember that? So it's interesting. Uh, I'm not anti-technology. I'm not necessarily pro-technology, but it's interesting to see the way people are thinking now and the way people discover and learn about music. It's definitely different from 20 years ago, say. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at Littlefield here in Brooklyn, New York. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Jesse Fisher and his band Soul Cycle for their time, as well as the staff and management here at Littlefield here in Brooklyn. As always, please visit my website, www.thepaceyport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.